Hello everyone, my name is the Fox. In this video, we're going to be reviewing Embernic's latest handheld, their RG556. Thank you very much to Embernic for sending this device out to me for review. This is using the new Unisoc T820 chip. So this is a chip that we haven't seen in any retro handheld yet. So we're going to be taking a look and seeing how this performs, especially compared to other devices that are out on the market. It starts at around $175. We'll talk about that in a little bit more. Let's start up with the specs first. Up first, obviously, to talk about is the 1080p 5.5-inch AMOLED display, which is actually really, really nice. It starts off with being a tinge bit blue, but we can correct this via Android's own system. We're going to touch base on that more in a little bit. Next up to talk about is obviously that Unisoc T820 chip. This is an octa-core chip. However, this is essentially two different CPUs that are on here. We have four Cortex A76. However, only one of those will clock up to 2.7 gigahertz. The other three A76 cores will only clock up to 2.3 gigahertz. The four remaining Cortex A55 chips are clock can clock up to 2.1 gigahertz. Now, largely for our purposes, when we're thinking about this for emulation purposes, the core that we're going to care about the most is that one singular core A Cortex A76 that clocks up to 2.7 gigahertz. That actually gets us across the finish line for a bunch of different emulation tasks. However, when we compare it to other different handhelds that are out on the market right now, we are going to be falling behind in a few different aspects. However, we're going to be pushing far further ahead than a lot of cheaper handhelds that are available right now. So this is going to find itself in a very interesting bracket where you want to have specific amount of power, but you also really want to have this very nice display. On the GPU side, we are looking at the quad-core Mali G57 that runs at 850 megahertz. I'm also glad to see that we are getting 8 gigs of LPDR4X RAM. This is a standard for the higher-end retro Android emulation handouts that are out there. I think that 8 gigs is kind of the minimum that we should be looking at, and this is just getting there what we want to be looking at compared to the other models that are available, especially in this price range, also having 8 gigs of RAM. We do have 128 gigs of UFS 2.2 storage that is on board. You can expand this with a micro SD card. It is running Android 13, and we also have Wi-Fi 2.4 and 5G, so you have full Wi-Fi and latest Bluetooth support with Bluetooth 5.0. I am going to be showcasing a number of different emulators and types of emulation tests that are going to be possible on this game. We're going to have a whole segment in this video demonstrating what this device is capable of. I want to first start off by talking about battery life. Battery life on this device is really excellent. However, if we compare it to something that just came out, like the Retro Pocket 4 Pro, we're finding that there is a little bit of a difference between the Unisoc 820 and the MediaTek uh, D1100 and so far is how they handle different power scopes. So if we take a look at my particular power test here on battery, we can see that I'm running the Crash Bandicoot test that I normally like to do. Because this is fairly intensive, however, not too strenuous on CPU, it is a good look at what types of the maximum battery life that you're going to get out of the device, reasonably speaking, right? You're going to be able to play something like PlayStation 1 emulation, which will do some 3D emulation as well as needing CPU as well. But even running this particular test, we're getting around 15 hours of gameplay. This is just under what we were seeing for the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, which has technically a smaller battery. The Embernic RG556 has a 5,500 milliamp hour battery, so around 10% greater in capacity than the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. However, the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is lasting about 30 minutes longer while having a slightly smaller battery. But this is still a very good result, having 15 hours for my Crash Bandicoot test that I have here. This is a best case battery life scenario, relatively speaking, right? Like if you take a look at general emulation tests and how long you'll be able to run at medium brightness, you're going to find that you're going to be able to get up to 15 hours of battery life. That doesn't mean you're going to get 15 hours of battery life everywhere. With more demanding tests, this is going to scale back a lot. If we start pushing this a lot harder, put maximum brightness, you're going to start really jotting down how much battery life you're going to get. Something to around about four or five hours. So anticipate between five hours to 15 hours of battery life, which is truly excellent and what we should expect from the current suite of handles that are on the market today. Next, let's take a look at what Embernix RG556 is reasonably able going to emulate on this device. Now I'm going to be showing you some stuff like from Atari or from Nintendo or any of the very, very older generations. And you should anticipate that most all of these are going to run without a hitch. The only thing that I want to kind of point out here is if we're going to be doing integer based scaling, there are going to be considerable uh, pillar boxing and litter boxing at the same time. So you will need to play around with how you're going to be scaling these elements. And you may have to turn off integer scaling just to properly fill out the screen as much as possible or use widescreen hacks to try to figure out how that's going to all align up inside of the frame of the OLED 1080p display. This is not to say that's a negative of the device, but it's something to keep in mind because there are other handhelds that have different aspect ratios, especially for retro handhelds that fill out the screen a little bit better and maximize that type of screen. So in this particular arrangement, we're looking at games 
that are going to be playable inside of this space, but we're also going to be able to play 16 by 9 games and other types of stuff like streaming games. We'll touch more on that in just a second. As we go along, there are some benchmark games that I like to run for emulation purposes. When we take a look at PlayStation 2 emulation, one game that I love to run as a benchmark game is Burnout 3. This is a game that honestly just recently, maybe just a few years ago, has been properly done so that it is actually re rendering correctly, it is emulating correctly. It used to be that the skybox wouldn't render, so you'd have to hack it up a bunch, and it's also a game that runs at 60 FPS, so it is quite demanding. This is a game that I consider a benchmark game, and if it runs on a handheld, then that is the benchmark that we're looking for, as if this game runs, then there's going to be a large percentage of PlayStation 2 games that are going to run. While we don't have full frame rate when running this game, there are some hitches, for the most part, it is quite playable. So in my look at this, when I take a look at it as a benchmark game, there are going to be a number of games on PlayStation 2 that may be too demanding to run on this particular console. The other thing to note is that the Ambernick RG556 has a standard and performance mode. However, in reality, that doesn't do much. And we'll talk more about that later on in this video. Another benchmark game that we like to run on the GameCube side is F-Zero. This is a game that demands to be run at 60 FPS. And if you have any hitches, it becomes very, very noticeable. And if you're getting something that is sub 60 frames a second quite often, it's basically unplayable. You really need to switch over to the PAL based version which runs at 50 FPS. Unfortunately, when I'm playing F-Zero on this particular retro handheld, I could not find any configuration, whether OpenGL or Vulkan or even using MMJR Dolphin, where this was something that was working reasonably well. So this is something to keep in mind that you're not going to have every GameCube game that is going to be working on this particular retro handheld. Also for PS2 emulation, there are going to be some challenging PS2 games that are not going to run that well, or you're going to have to pivot your thought and not get the NTSC versions and get the PAL versions to be able to play them well. That's just something to keep in mind. Moving down the chain a little bit, Saturn is a very hard emulator to run. In fact, Dreamcast, which is a more advanced console that came out, is far easier to emulate than Saturn is, just because of Saturn's particular architecture. One game that I love demonstrating as a benchmark game for my own is Dragon Force 2. There's a translated version of this that came out. I'm a huge fan of Dragon Force as it is. The thing that I want to make note is that you can actually hear it just in the main menu screen. If you hear audio popping, that is a significant indicator that the CPU is just not able to handle the emulation to actually catch up. And you need to use Beatles Saturn uh, emulator because it's the only one that is accurate enough to actually emulate the game. There is no other Saturn emulator that will actually run this game. So this is a benchmark game that I like to run because if it runs this, chances are it's going to run pretty much every Saturn game underneath it. So if you're looking at to play some Saturn emulation, this is one particular avenue that you want to look at, and this is going to be something that is going to be really nice. Outside of that, everything underneath it is going to run just fine. N64, yeah, Game Boy, Game Year 32X, Genesis, Super Nintendo... Uh, all of that is just going to run just fine, and it looks absolutely stunning on the display itself, especially when you think of like all the pillar boxing and letter boxing. All of that from the OLED display is just pure black. The whole package itself makes it very, very nice to play, especially the ergonomics of the device, so that's something to also keep in mind. Other experiences worth mentioning are game streaming. Now, unfortunately, the analog sticks on Amberdix RG556 aren't good at all, so playing games via streaming just feel really not great. Like, just moving around, playing Doom, it's such... It, because the analog sticks want to snap to their cardinal directions and they will go to their maximum offset with just pushing in a little, effectively, the analog sticks more or less feel like digital. It would have made more sense for Ambernick to just have bigger analog sticks, bigger and better analog sticks on us, because the ergonomics of the device are already taking up so much space. Why wouldn't you just, at that point, get bigger analog sticks on there and just have a better control scheme overall because you're already wasting space on the ergonomics. So from a game streaming point of view, unless you're using the D-pad, it's not something that I personally find good. It streams fine. The Wi-Fi in it is perfectly fine. I didn't have any issue with streaming and everything was crystal clear, no latency, all that stuff was all great. However, the analog sticks aren't good enough to actually be using for a streaming point of view. So if you're looking at this to get as like a console companion, to stream cloud games or go on like GeForce Now. I really can't recommend it from that angle at all. Another thing worth mentioning is Android games working on this by itself. Also, Netflix works on this device. There's no problem. You can go ahead and install Netflix. You can download Netflix movies, play Netflix stuff. But also Netflix has their own game center where if you have a Netflix subscription, you can download games that run on Android directly. So there are going to be Android native games that are already included in your Netflix subscription. And there's a bunch of games that you might not know that you already have access to that you can play if you're already a Netflix subscriber. In this case, I'm playing Dead Cells and Dead Cells works just fine. 
So I'm using typically the D-pad to control everything. You can use the analog stick, and because the analog stick is very D-pad-like, it works just fine for Dead Cells or a very 2D-based game. So that's something that you should keep in mind is that Android games are going to run really well on this. If they require the analog stick, it's not going to be the best case scenario. However, you have a lot of different games that you're going to be able to play on Ambernix RG556. With that out of the way, let's get into the build quality part of this review where we're going to be looking at the fit and finish of the device itself. Especially when we're going to be taking a closer look at the D-pad. Uh, I really do think it's fantastic. The analog stick and showing you how they aren't great at all. And we're also going to be touching base on all the ergonomics of the device, as well as finally stacked shoulder buttons. Let's get into it. Jumping into the build quality part of this review for Ambernix latest RG556, we see Ambernix latest design, which is far more ergonomic than their older designs. You can see their slimline candy bar designs right there. Now, those are far more practical for space saving considerations. But if you wanted something that was honestly far more comfortable to use, especially at length, this new type of design that they have that is very reminiscent of a lot of different controllers, game controllers themselves, it has been really good to use and feels super comfortable. Additionally, they have the analog stick and D-pad offset by a good amount. So even using the analog stick to the D-pad is very comfortable overall. So ergonomics wise, it's a big plus over a lot of the older Ambernic designs, especially the types of plastic that the plastic that is used here. I didn't really feel any type of thermal transference over there. So it remained very, very cool. Obviously it's a very low power device. So you really shouldn't be expecting much of that to be transferring over, but the different types of color designs that they have are really nice. And I really do appreciate this translucent blue one. That is the shell itself. For the most part, a lot of the things that you're going to, we're going to be looking at here are very reminiscent of a lot of Ambernic stuff. One of the things that I love that Amarink does, if we can get a close-up of this, if you take a look right here, you can see very clearly that the screen protector is absolutely flush with the inset of the display itself, meaning that the included screen protector that they include on here, number one, is very easy to apply because it's going to fit into this groove perfectly. But overall, you're not going to have this weird little kind of sitting floating screen protector on top of it. It feels like this is how it's supposed to be. So that's one thing that Ambernick has done often with their types of devices where the screen protector will always be fitting inside of this inset. It's one little thing that Ambernick often does, not all the time, but they often do it. And it's a thing that I truly appreciate. I know that some people get a little upset with very glossy types of material and having like smudges and fingerprints remaining on there. This D-pad is that type of plastic where it will have that same type of feeling. The D-pad is truly excellent. We're going to get into that in a moment where we talk about inputs in a moment. Let's just finish going around the bottom of the device. We have a 3.5 millimeter RA jack, our charging USB-C port. Now, this USB-C port, you can see that it's not really aligned all that well. It's something that I really hope that a lot more of Ambernic devices, maybe this one is just a one-off, that other ones have something that looks like when it's being mounted on there via the factory, that it looks clean. Finishing off the bottom, we have this micro SD card slot. And because it's translucent, we can actually see the bottom. So you can see how it kind of slips out, which is really nice. So that's where you're going to be putting your micro SD card slots if you wanted to have expanded storage and not have to worry about buying or purchasing expanded storage on the board itself, depending because they do sell different EMMC storage sizes when you're going on the order page. Along the right side, we just finish it off. There's nothing else there. It just looks rather handsome. And at the top, we have stacked shoulders. Thank goodness. Obviously, we have a, a lot of meat here for where the handle is. So we should have space for having stacked shoulders as opposed to inline shoulders, which has been something that Ambernick has been doing for Ever now, so I'm glad that they went with these stacked shoulders. I don't necessarily think that it's necessary to have this much grip to have stacked shoulders as opposed to inline, but I'm grateful that Ambernick did it. Here we have our exhaust port, we have our volume up and down, and our power button. Feel wise on the triggers, they're perfectly fine. I don't think that there's anything wrong or anything that I really need to comment on exactly. They are very unique in their feel. I wouldn't say that I could find a quick analogy towards anything. They do feel like I would say elongated switch controllers, obviously analog in nature versus digital. So that's something to kind of keep in mind, but overall it is very comfortable in hand. Now let's start talking about these analog sticks. These analog sticks are terrible. They're awful. So if you had any desire, uh, the display is also, when it first boots up, has a very blue tinge to it. We're going to show you how you can fix that in a moment, but I just want to jump over to the gamepad section of this. Taking a look at the analog sticks, we can see that, I mean, they're just, they might as well be digital. Uh, they almost immediately jump out to their outer edge. There is no problem with going to full range. I mean, they go to full range almost instantly. There's heavy cardinal mag magnetism. You can see how they want to move is we're making this very big plus movement here and very little 
actual movement that's here. Even just like generally moving them around, it doesn't feel very, very good. So this, these analog sticks are... I mean, if you already have something where you have a bunch of meat here and you're not trying to save space, obviously, because this takes up a bunch of space. At this point, if you're going to be taking up this much space, Ambernick, why wouldn't you just get bigger analog sticks? Because at that point, we can have far better analog sticks. And we're throwing away compact size here with these types of handles anyway. So at that point, just get better analog sticks because these are not good at all. However, the D-pad that is on Ambernick's RG556 is the best Ambernick D-pad that is a traditional membrane-based D-pad they have ever made, bar none. This is a fantastic D-pad, and I would almost give it an A-plus ranking. I would just say that 8 just edge it out a bit. This is still fantastic, but there is a feel to it that I'm not really all sold on, and 8 membrane-based really are the best in that regard. However, that is truly sensational. If you were looking at other D-pads that are also excellent, Ambernick make, makes the Arc-D D-pad. This is reminiscent of the Saturn D-pad, which has a high pivot point and has a completely different feeling. This is also a truly excellent D-pad, but it's something that I think Ambernick has, at this point, in my opinion, have made a very good name for themselves with regard to knowing what they're doing on their D-pads, and this is truly their best d-pad yet jumping into the display we're going to be talking about a few different things first up i want to address that there when you first boot it up it's going to have this very blue tinge to it what you should do is go over to settings how i found mine was it was defaulted to this automatic mode in display if you go to colors and contrast right here this was set to auto mode i would get out of automatic contrast and just go to standard this alone has helped immensely. It has a far less pronounced blue feel to it. Now, I would say that this particular live wallpaper makes things worse or can kind of flavor to be far too blue. So I would go ahead and say change the wallpaper. This is going to make it something that is a little bit easier to see, something that I wanted to do myself. So I just go to home screen and set it. Now, the other thing to note is you may be able to see on my display that there's this kind of rippling effect. That is because of the OLED panel itself and how it does its PWM. If we max out the brightness, you're not going to actually see anything. And I'll show you that in just a second. So the strobing that you're seeing is a PWM type of quality that a lot of OLED panels exhibit. And this is how they kind of control their brightness is that instead of just uh, dimming the pixels themselves, they'll kind of roll through and uh, fluctuate how fast they're turning on and off. Depending on the brightness is going to be how going to depend on how much strobing is happening. For what it's worth, this is a type of BFI as I've always seen it because there isn't a backlight like LCDs are where you're going to have the back panel that is strobing against a static set of screen because this is self-emissive. This is an OLED panel which should help motion clarity. So the other thing that I want to take a look at is just the display info itself. Taking a look at the panel itself, we do have a 5.5 inch 1080p AMOLED panel. It is running at 60 hertz. Every way that I looked at it, this 60 hertz is locked. It's really, really good. The nits that is reported goes up to 500, which is very, very bright. And when we take a look at brightness for how dim it gets, it gets really, really low as well. The other thing that I wanted to point out here is the touch sampling rate. And this is always important. This is reporting at 116 hertz, the sampling rate that it's getting. So it's basically double of whatever the refresh rate is, which is what we like to see. We like to see touch sampling rate to be at least double of whatever the panel refresh rate is. Okay, so let's start wrapping up my particular review for Ambinix RG556. There are some things that I don't like about the device, but where this device finds itself in the current landscape at the moment, being at the early bird pricing at $175 with shipping on top of that, it does find itself in a spot that it is comparable to other devices, specifically like the Retro Pocket 4 Pro, which I just recently reviewed, which finds itself at $200 plus shipping on top of it as well. Now the performance from the D1100, the MediaTek D1100, finds itself to be a little bit better than what we can get on here. We can actually get it across the finish line in a lot of different ways that are better than the Unisoc uh, T20 that we have here. So if you're looking from a pure performance angle, I would say get the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. However, if you're looking at ergonomics, the Ambernick RG556 is a clear winner. Obviously it's gonna be bigger because the, the ergonomics of the device are larger, it has more meat on it. So from whatever angle you're looking at, if you want something that's more stowable, something that's going to take up less space, the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is going to win in that matter. However, the display, the AMOLED display on this device is superior than what is on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Even though what's on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is fine, there's just a lot of weird issues going on with that display. And it is a very nice device. However, the AMOLED display on this is nice as well. So you really have to think about 
what types of games you're looking to emulate on this device first before you go anywhere else. Now, the things that I really don't like on this are the analog sticks. The Retroid Pocket 4 Pro has analog sticks that seemingly they're the only ones that have, and honestly, they're far better. These ones are practically digital in nature, so that's something that, I don't know, I just really can't get behind. So that's something that I just find to be a genuine negative for this. Also, we take a look at performance on this. When we take use Everdick's own software to change from standard mode to performance mode, nothing really changes effectively. There is no benefit to doing either or. And I didn't even see any difference in terms of battery life of changing those performance levels. So that's something that just seems a bit odd. So from an Android system level and how things are configured on this thing, the Retro Pocket series of devices is a bit better in that regard as well, especially updating the device. I still think that with the pricing of this model, especially the earlier pricing, it does find itself in a really good way. The AMOLED display, the ergonomics of the controls, and how everything else works, minus the analog sticks, are very good. That's pretty much everything that I could say about Ambernick's latest device, their RG556. I hope this was informative. As always, guys, thank you for your time, and thanks for watching.